That sounds like it's work. Yep. There we go. Got yours on?
there it is. Okay. Can we sit? Oh, okay. There's a bit of bearish here, so. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for UT Health San Antonio's first year being involved in the San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week. Mm. We are excited to present to you the first event of three UT Health San Antonio events this evening, where we will be discussing traumatic brain injuries and their relation to sports and the biosciences. I am Robert Graham. I am a consultant at the Office of Technology Commercialization here at UT Health San Antonio. My background is in the biosciences and my undergraduate education was concentrated in neuroscience. So tonight's um, discussion is of particular interest to me. However, I know that you will find it as interesting as I do. For tonight's discussion, we have gathered a distinguished panel of experts that will be able to shed more light on the topic of traumatic brain injury. 
a topic that has recently began to capture the interests of the general public. But before we start, I would like to remind the audience to text SE, SA, excuse me, SAEW37 to the automated message you received earlier. With that being said, I will now hand it off to my colleague, Rafa Varasa. Rafa is a PhD candidate here at UT Health San Antonio, getting his PhD in translational science. And as such, he is a perfect candidate for moderating tonight's event. Thank you everyone for uh, coming to this important talk and uh, we're very excited to be part of, uh, of this special week for entrepreneurship here in San Antonio and to highlight some of uh, the incredible research and companies that are coming out of, uh, of our institution. Uh, well, I'm going to do a very brief introduction to our great panelists uh, here today. Uh, we're going to do Dr. Carlos Jaramillo. He uh, has a PhD in developmental biology and an MD from George Washington University. He did his uh, residency here at UT, UT Health San Antonio in physical medicine and re rehabilitation. And he focuses, he works at the VA, uh, working with patients that suffer traumatic brain injuries. Also joining us today is Dr. Kornick. Uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Astrocyte Pharmaceuticals, a company that's spun out of this institution. He has an, a PhD from Harvard University and he has a great background working with companies such as Pfizer. And also one of our own, Dr. Uh, Lechleiter. He is a professor here at the institution and he's also the co-founder of Astrocyte Pharmaceuticals. He focuses on studying drugs and looking at molecules that can prevent traumatic brain injuries and strokes. He specifically focuses on a, a, a type of cell called astrocytes. And I'll just let the panel tell you a little bit more about themselves, the research, and why this topic is so important. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, so, Carlos Jaramillo. I'm a faculty member at uh, UT Health Science Center in the Department of Rehabilitation and Medicine as well. I'm also a GREC faculty member at the VA, which is a geriatrics focused um, clinical and research uh, uh, group. And um, I have a long held interest in uh, the aging processes and uh, how injuries affect uh, aging and it, vice versa, and uh, how to best uh, treat people who've incurred injuries and are um, going to have these injuries with them for some time. So. Um, we are involved in clinical research trials. I'm the uh, director of the clinical research program in the Polytrauma Center here in San Antonio. I also see patients in the outpatient setting. Uh, these are usually Iraq, Afghanistan veterans that have had a mild traumatic brain injury, but they also range up to the severe. Um, but they have a, a range of injuries, as, as you all have probably heard uh, before. And uh, I do um, a lot of different types of treatments um, as a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. Uh, we are physicians, obviously we prescribe medications, but I've had to kind of change my toolbox quite some over the last five years um, in order to address this pay, uh, population appropriately. Um, having to move away from medications and understanding what the medications are, are contributing or, or uh, helping um, with the symptoms that they're dealing with. So, I use medical acupuncture now uh, quite a bit, and we're trying some new things in the VA that's um, it's quite innovative. I haven't had a lot of fun with that. Thank you so much. So I'm Jim Lechleiter. I'm a professor here at the health, uh, UT Health um, uh, San Antonio, and I've been here about 20 years now. So I'm actually, my appointment's in the Department of Cell Systems and Anatomy, but I sort of consider myself a neuroscientist. Uh, I've been interested in neuroscience, you know, ever since I got into graduate school, and and for most of my career, I actually was focused on uh, cell biology. You know, essentially looking at cell culture, all in vitro systems, and it was really only in the, I'd say, last 15 years that we started moving into whole animals, and we've got very interested in sort of the basic physiology, the basic cell biology of astrocytes, which is sort of that other cell type in the brain that people tend to forget about, and it turns out to be a really fun cell to study, and then it's actually playing a really huge role in sort of maintaining the overall health of the brain. And so we, we found a way to stimulate that cell, and so we've been following up, trying to understand why, if we sort of stimulate this cell type, sort of force it to do its job a little bit better, um, why that actually helps the brain under conditions of stress. And, and what we've studied mostly so far are things like, you know, trauma to the uh, mouse, it's all preclinical studies, or stroke. And, and um, I'm basically 
uh, basic science, I guess, is where I came with this from. It wasn't expected. And, and now we're just hoping it'll eventually get translated into um, uh, eventually a treatment of people. So I'm Bill Kornick, I'm the CEO at Astrocyte Pharmaceuticals, and Rafa did a pretty good job on the background. Uh, so maybe I'll just be a little bit more myself as it relates to entrepreneurship, since this is Entrepreneurship Week here in San Antonio. Uh, I started off in the science as in getting a, a PhD, but I think I fairly quickly was drawn to the business side as well. I thought it was very important to have a foot both on the, the science and the business side. And so I spent a number of years in consulting and then going to the business side on a pharmaceutical company, Pfizer. Uh, but I also thought it was important to kind of be at a strategic level and at an operational level. So I was fortunate in my consulting time, we were working on a lot of uh, strategies. Is this loud? Is it uh, good audio? Okay. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on strategic plans with a, a number of biotechs and pharmaceutical companies and working with this consulting firm. And then when I went to Pfizer, I was in an R&D strategy role. Uh, but then I migrated over time to be in much more operational roles and was in charge of you know, coordinating business planning process across the various therapeutic areas and functional departments at Pfizer. And I think and I, being able to do that early in my career, to look both on the science and business side, look at the strategic side and, and operational was very helpful in thinking about you know, this opportunity that became Astrocyte Pharmaceuticals and just having more comfort or confidence to, to jump in into a, a startup situation. And as it relates to TBI, well, we'll talk more about this, but it's something that I was probably on the sidelines on as a, as a fan of the NFL and having three young kids in contact sports. Uh, but it's been very fascinating as I've, I've really dove into this over the past few years and just understanding uh, the, the kind of the scope of the, the challenge here and how it's really emerged, not just in our awareness, but uh, in the science and what we really need to be doing collectively to help address it. Well, to, to start off uh, with the topic of today's discussion is TBI. Uh, Dr. Jaramillo, since you're a physician, could you just tell us uh, the difference between what a concussion is, a TBI, and, a, and the new term, which is the CT, the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, and, and what happens in the brain when, this ha when these traumatic events occur? Just to give us an overall picture of it. Yeah, those are all long discussions, but um, the, the definitions for traumatic brain injury get complicated. Uh, they're very broad at this point. We talk about mild traumatic brain injury, moderate, and severe. And um, that's a, a very gross clinical description. And it's usually determined based on how long a person's lost consciousness, um, their difficulty with memory of the event, how long they can remember before the event happened. And then sometimes things like um, uh, what shows up on an MRI or a CT scan. So there's ways of putting people in those categories. Uh, and that's usually at the triage level, you, you do that to see if they need surgical intervention. Um, there's some prognostic abilities that we get with those gross classifications, but that's, um, that's, a, that's a little bit of um, where we stand. It's, it's oversimplified. Um, concussion falls on the mild traumatic brain injury realm, and it's it tends to be synonymous uh, with mild traumatic brain injury. Um, and there are some groups that, that really want us to stop using the term concussion and use the, the term mild traumatic brain injury. And there are sports groups that have really adopted concussion as, as the moniker. So they're, they're, they tend to be synonymous. But what happens uh, in a concussion is that the, the head, neck, or the body uh, receives a blow and then the brain within the skull uh, moves. And those forces within the skull uh, cause the actual injury to the central nervous system. So the water jacket, the CSF that surrounds the brain in a day-to-day -day, uh, living environment kind of protects the brain. It's a little bit of a uh, cushion, but when the brain moves within the skull, that's when we actually have the, uh, the effects. Now, um, what happens to the brain in other types of um, severity of traumatic brain injuries it depends on, on the mechanism. So um, as you can imagine, a penetrating head injury like a gunshot, obviously that's a very, very different effect. So it ranges quite a bit. There's a lot of variation um, at the molecular level. Jim can speak to extremely well, but I, they, they, there's a lot of variability in there. Okay. Uh, Dr. Kornick, uh, concussions and CT have become very uh, increasingly highlighted in the media, especially with what happened with the NFL. 
Um, could you provide some background on the statistics? Are these things, are these events ca are becoming more common or, or is it just that the fact that now that we, the, ha the media is putting more attention, we're noticing this? Um, so yes, there's been a lot of uh, growth in public awareness and media attention over the you know, past five, ten years. And while some of that's you know, probably due to the celebrity nature of NFL athletes that have been getting CTE, uh, there's a kind of more significant underlying issue here that is, I think, a little bit frightening, actually. Uh, in Retrospect, in with hindsight, we can see that this is not a new disease. That there is, you know, that people have been getting concussions. There is repetitive trauma, and there. And like I said, in hindsight, we can recognize uh, this in historical subpopulations. Like there's even scrolls that go back to the Egyptians and definitions of people with psychological challenges after head trauma in, in 1600 BC. Uh, but uh, it's probably most well traced back to boxers who became punch drunk, and it was you know, defined, and, and, but it was a small population, so people didn't uh, follow it that closely or do much with that information. Uh, beyond that, there's, again, other cohorts, and usually typically with the military veterans. So when you think about the World War I groups that were shell-shocked, and you, that kind of, there's a cohort of patients that had this, but again, uh, due to it being a small population, emerging much later in their lives, questions of whether it's actually Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or other you know, comorbidities, it really hasn't received that much attention. But this has really changed kind of around the 50s and 60s. So around the 50s, you started moving to sports like boxing where they had padded gloves. Football introduced the, the hard helmets with face masks. And in the late 60s, early 70s, you started having kind of sports like high school or football that's happening in youth, and not just in high school and older. So the fact that we're having many people or many groups now repeatedly kind of hitting their head uh, as in recreational activities and contact sports is a very new phenomenon. I mean, those people that were teenagers in the 60s are kind of in their 60s now. And so it, you have this kind of wave now of you know, adolescents and teenagers and people that have been doing these contact sports and in our military situations having much more kind of blast technology uh, around them that you see there's a new population here that has grown up in this you know, context for repetitive trauma situation. And so the numbers are starting to grow significantly. I mean, we've seen the, you know, in the NFL population, I think there's 20,000 NFL players and veterans out there. And in military veterans, there's about 350,000 that are believed to have concussions. So it's another uh, population that exists. But you look at the number of high school and college contact sport athletes in the US, it's like 20 million. And this is a, a large wave of our, you know, adolescents and now people moving into you know, later adulthood that you know, have been in this big experiment now where we're seeing a lot more repetitive trauma. And so it's not surprising that we're starting to recognize this more in you know, people in their 50s, 60s, 70s and diagnosing it more frequently. It's, again, it's a recent phenomenon that we were, we're having this much head contact, head trauma in such a large population. So, I, it's a little frightening when you think about that terms. We still have a lot more to learn about the, the disease, but there's a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people that you know, are in this population. Uh, Dr. Jaramillo, and then I'll ask a question to Dr. Lake Leiter. Is there a treatment for TBI currently? Ah, well, what we're doing clinically is we're addressing the symptoms. So again, going back to what, we, what I was saying about the severity, um, for a concussion, you, you address those symptoms. They tend to resolve uh, within the first couple of weeks. The vast majority of people who have a concussion, it, it goes away on its own. Um, and there are some guidelines, depending on if it's a sports-related injury or, or not, um, what you should do for those individuals. Uh, for some of them, those symptoms will persist, and they approximate it at 10%, although those numbers may change as we understand more and more uh, of what could cause a, a persistent um, syndrome. For the moderate and severe injuries, uh, our treatments are a, a little more evolved. We've been doing this for a couple of decades now, uh, treating severe injuries. These are disabling events. Uh, they get neurosurgical intervention. Uh, these are life-saving emergency uh, interventions. And then they go through long uh, hospital courses, and they require inpatient rehabilitation. So. Um, 
that's about getting them back to functioning. And, and for severe head injuries, it's treating those comorbidities that can be lifelong impairments. So seizures, um, epilepsy disorders are, are, are common comorbidities, but neuroendocrine um, issues, uh, as well as um, non-neurologic or, or things that we don't consider non-neurologic, uh, non, uh, so like bladder and um, bladder dysfunction, sexual dysfunction, sleep issues. So we try and address those, but um, you know, you, you had asked about the, uh, the definition of CTE, of chronic uh, traumatic encephalopathy. There, there's, no, there's no way to address that currently. And that's considered a, a neuropathology. That's something that you see on, on autopsy, and that's only been recently kind of brought to the public's attention. Uh, is that scar tissue? Is that a disease process? These are unanswered questions, but it's thought to be a neurodegenerative issue. So much like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, um, as uh, Will was saying, uh, you treat those issues. So it's, it's kind of addressing the secondary things now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Dr. Leglider, uh, your research focuses on hopefully finding potential treatments for TBI. Can you tell us a little bit about your research and how these potential molecules or, or uh, compounds that you're looking into can hopefully eventually help the patients in the, in the long run? Okay, it's, it's a bit of a <laughs> mouthful too. So, so I, I guess backing up, I, I wanted to talk about the brain a little bit about its cell types, its parts, and, and we always think of the brain of having nerve cells, and people always forget about the support cells in the brain. And there are these glial cell types, and, and the main ones are sort of the inherent immune cell, which is called the microglia, and the other one is really the astrocyte, and it's really come into its own sort of being its last, I'd say, several decades, people are really recognizing that it's more than glue. Glial literally means glue, and they thought that's what it was, sort of held the bearing together earlier on. But it's quite clear now it plays a huge role in, in, in its maintenance, not only of sort of you know, normal uh, physiology, but during, ER, during stress of any time, any kind of trauma, they play really big roles. And so that's kind of what we've tapped into in our research, what we've tried to focus on, is sort of look at the underlying physiology of this natural caretaker in the brain, and then we actually have been looking for ways to sort of stimulate that sort of natural healing ability. And, and, and so we've actually then stimulated um, all these different processes that the astrocyte does. You know, so it does things like maintain the salt balance in the brain, which is very important for things like fluid and edema, um, which actually are really problems after any kind of injury. Um, there are things that are toxic that have to do with the, the imbalance of ions that occur. And, and again, the astrocyte tries to get this whole environment back under control and so all those take energy so, so the, you know in a short sort of way to describe it these energy dependent processes in the cell we found a way to stimulate you know, force the astrocyte basically to make more ATP more energy and it really gives the, the cell more you know uh, it can do a better job for a longer period of time and so essentially we don't really change what the astrocyte does. It really knows best how to sort of respond to a crisis situation in the brain. But what we've been able to sort of tap in as we give it a bit more added energy, it's sort of filled up its batteries a bit more, its mitochondrial uh, metabolism is what we've specifically focused in on. And because of that, they just do a better job. And so they can take care of the brain better. And really, um, um, I think that's the short answer. You know. So, so these uh, astrocyte pharmaceuticals has a compound and how, and br briefly, basically, what is it doing to help? Uh, so, so this is actually a small molecule mm -hmm. um, that we've been looking at, and it's actually now in its fourth generation. So this is part of the fun part of, of pharmaceuticals and working with Bill here that we've now been able to sort of develop our initial discovery that we had something of benefit, that we knew that when we treated the cells, actually the earlier experiments were done in cell culture, and we knew that if we fed them this drug, um, they were more resistant to stress as they lived longer, more cells survived. And now um, we've actually evolved to the point that this particular molecule um, is a bit more, it's probably as potent, it's got a few other properties, it's a bit more stable. But what it does, it specifically binds to receptor on the astrocyte. And then there's a series of biochemical steps that eventually lead to calcium release inside cells. It actually will then be taken up by the organelle in your cells that's responsible for making most of the ATP, that's the mitochondria. And the mitochondria just makes more ATP. And then downstream of the ATP is things like restoring the ion balance, which is so critical after an injury, or 
you may have heard of something called glutamate excitotoxicity. After traumas, a lot of times after a stroke or a trauma, um, the brain becomes hyper-excited. And some of this is because of the salt imbalances too. And when that happens, there's an excess release of this excitatory neurotransmitter, which has all kinds of toxic consequences. Not the least of which actually is because of so many about stress and, and the neurons just get exhausted trying to deal with all this extra um, imbalances. And so the acid plays crucial roles in trying to restore that sort of salt balance. They actually will also take up this, this what's called glutamate, this excitotoxic you know, um, uh, reagent, and actually will sequester that and kind of clear and settle things down again. All those took ATP, and by stimulating our cells to make more ATP, they just do a better job until so they kind of <coughs> prevent it from getting out of hand. Because a lot of the injury that occurs is not that initial trauma, it's actually these subsequent secondary damages that occur. And so it's not just the initial hit, it's the secondary damage that occurs over hours and even days after the initial traumas. So. So we could probably talk for hours about science and some of the studies that have been done, but um, as it relates to tonight's topic, uh, you should probably highlight the, the, the long-term study with the repetitive concussions that uh, actually, I think, relates. Okay. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, so this is actually, we were all very acutely aware of uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So, so, to be honest, initially when I started looking at this, I knew about TBI and, and I heard about punch drunk, but I didn't really know what that was. But it was certainly these long-term symptoms, which was quite frightening because uh, essentially we knew that people who had repetitive head injuries actually in one sense became more normal for quite a period of time, but it was literally decades later that actually injuries would start to manifest. All of a sudden you start maybe months, but years sometimes, you'd start maybe getting headaches, you know, disrupted sleep. Uh, Dr. Harmiel can actually describe some of the symptoms, but it's progression to the point where you can literally um, have antisocial behavior, depression, eventually suicidal thoughts. It's really, and degenerative uh, diseases where the brain uh, cognition, a lot of things will just completely deteriorate. And so, so we looked at, could we actually make an animal model to study that process? So because it takes so many years, it's really problematic to study it and treat in humans. And so what we did is to take a mouse model, which is actually the standard which you want to use in medical practices or medical research, um, hit the mouse every day um, for five days in a row, uh, mild traumas, and, and we're trying to sort of simulate that football hit or something, you know. Um, and then we actually put the mouse back in their cages and then we watched them. Um, actually, we would check on them every now and then, not, not continuously. But nothing happened. It was nine months later and still nothing happened. We'd test them. It was actually a year after that that we started doing some behavioral tests and all of a sudden we noticed that there was some hyperactivity. You know, it wasn't that they were sort of, um, it was almost like they were frightened. They just were afraid of their, their, their environments. And so we'd put them down in actually an open field. And we noticed they would run further in a half hour period. Or they'd do more rotations. They were just hyperactive. I would call it sort of a nervous phenotype. And then it turned out they also had motor coordination problems. You know, there is some standard tests that they use in Parkinson's disease where where essentially you can put a mouse on a vertical pole and it's just a gentle behavioral test and they'll turn around very nicely and crawl down. Um, and they're very coordinated doing this. They have no trouble at all doing this. But the mice that we'd hit repeatedly um, really, really had trouble turning around at all. They were just, and they turn around and they kind of slip and slide. They just have coordination problems. Um, and it turned out the drug that we were using that worked so well acutely also really benefited and we just didn't see those effects in the long-term animals. So we're really excited about these you know, the research of these long-term effects are also benefit, you know, from the acute treatments. So. Since it is Entrepreneurship Week, Dr. Kornick, where do you go from being a scientist and then taking that step, working for Pfizer, great company, huge company, and then they, taking that, you know, next step as a risk of going into a startup with, with a molecule that is right now in, in the stages of preclinical? So can you tell us a little bit about your, your journey and, and why you see this as a, hopefully a potential cure for TBI? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, so I started talking with uh, Dr. Lechleiter uh, back in early 2014, and we've known each other for a, a long time. And as we started talking about his research and how it was evolving, uh, I was kind of immediately impressed by the opportunity, uh, kind of both on the kind of that's the health impact it would have, and this, which correlates to a commercial opportunity as well, uh, but essentially a neuroprotective molecule that can you know, treat stroke, which is the number two killer worldwide, treat traumatic brain injury and concussions, this growing epidemic. You know, that's something that's very exciting and you know, kind of engaged me in my passion that it could really help change the world. Uh, so that really you know, draws you in. And in addition to the opportunity, 
it was a really novel approach. I mean, I think people, there's lots of kind of me too aspects, they're just another job. Uh, uh, this one was just a very novel approach. So as Jim highlighted, most of neuroscience has been centered on neurons for, for many, many years. Uh, this was an approach that was going after the support cells, the afterthought, the glue, and it's, it was a new breaking area of research. So not only was it a, a, an enormous opportunity, it was something that was you know, just a very novel approach that could, you could think of all different options and things that could come from that. And then I think the, the last ingredient was just, is, is timing, which is something that's more of a, on a personal level for, for many people, is at the right time, uh, kind of not just for the opportunity, but for, for you personally. And I was in a situation where I felt I could, I could, could, could take a leap <laughs> and jump and, and uh, try this for a few years and, and see if it, if it works. And, and my family would be okay and life would go on. And the people around me and particularly uh, Dr. Lecklider here, uh, were fantastic people. So it was, uh, it made that uh, all the more appealing. And I think my, my wife said it best, you know, that you would regret this if you didn't do it. And so that was part of the, the kind of the last uh, push that said that, you know, I have to try this. That probably didn't make it any less frightening at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I was frightened, you know, when I first started out this whole process. That now it, was, it got very real. All of a sudden there was always this possibility of, you know, you've got a potential interesting finding in the basic science workbench, you know, and you always think, well, you always write that this is going to end up someplace in a clinic, you know, but you never really think, you know, how's that going to happen? So I was sort of the naive scientist, and so, um, and then all of a sudden, when you quit your job, you know, at Pfizer, then it was quite real. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> it's still frightening at various times, you know? Dr. Tramillo, uh, with the patients that you currently see right now, um, as a physician, you're treating these patients, it must be frustrating not having you know, a, a drug or the magic bullet to, to cure these patients. Uh, Dr. Licklider and Dr. Corning are hopefully you know, working on something right. that eventually helps the patients. It takes a long time to go from the, from the bench to the clinic. Right. right. Uh, what, what is your perspective on, 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 on the gaps that we have now and as, as, as physicians, what do you think they can do better to treat these patients? Yeah, that, it is frustrating. Um, you know, I went to medical school and the idea is you, you identify what the disease or the process is and then you use a drug and that's what we learn in medical school. You use that drug <laughs> to fix that. And then uh, I started practicing and the vast majority of my patients had a history of a concussion, not that severe one that I was talking about where we have treatment uh, guidelines. Concussion with a bunch of symptoms, uh, usually headaches, but also dizziness, concentration difficulties, um, and then other things that trickled out from that, insomnia, anxiety, um, and uh, uh, there's a, a list of what we call post-concussive uh, symptoms. So trying to work through that as a physician, you know, you, you, have, you build what's called a differential diagnosis. You say, have headaches, um, so what could be causing that? What are these types of headaches? And that's the treatment guideline, is you, you address those symptoms as an independent entity. Uh, and the drugs that we were using, the medications that we were using to treat some things were causing complications with other things. So that became even more complicated. It was, um, especially you have a patient with insomnia, chronic pain, uh, headaches, as well as, say, low back pain, but uh, PTSD, depression, and, um, and they're having trouble concentrating, but they're on a list of, say, seven or eight medications that all impact the nervous system, and they're in their mid-30s, trying to go to school. They have a family. They have two kids. They're not sleeping. Why are they not concentrating? Well, I can, I can give you a bunch of reasons. Um, maybe it's the medications as well. So we had to start peeling back on that. Now my, my uh, perspective as a, um, a person who was interested in geriatric rehabilitation and that training has always had a focus on, on, uh, on what the impact of the medications are, polypharmacy. So I had that kind of bias going in. And so seeing a 35 year old and not assuming that they can handle this medication load just because they're young, uh, I started having to ask those questions. What can we do instead? And so, you know, some of the clinical trials that, that we're running there are non-pharmacologic interventions, um, just because of the side effect profiles, trying to find other things that can help. Um, and looking at the epidemiology of how these comorbidities impact each other and what's predictive, uh, looking at the long-term outcomes. Um, 
and then using non-farm approaches like acupuncture to try and get at these symptoms. And, and you know, uh, it was nice to, to find that acupuncture has a, a pretty good evidence base for certain um, symptoms in particular. So, for example, he headaches. The evidence base is, is excellent for headaches. Uh, it's a great treatment, and there's, you know, no side effects, but it doesn't address everything. So we have to use um, additional mechanisms. So there's electronic devices. Uh, there are apps for concentration, for sleep. There's a lot of room for innovation out there for, for getting at these symptoms for concussions to try and accelerate the healing process and get these people functioning. So my specialty practice, we're, we're obsessed with function. Say not just necessarily the, the brain or the, the knee, but it's about how the person's performing and functioning. So um, we try and use everything we can. So it is, it is frustrating, though. But, but also uh, there's room for innovation. So if you have that kind of mindset, it's perfect. Yeah. You know, t 10, 20 years ago, to say the word acupuncture in a yeah. medical school was crazy. Can you tell us a little bit more about, about this technique and how I mean, just inform the public that if, if it's evidence-based, I mean, if we can use it, why not? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's been an eye-opener for me for the last uh, four or five years, um, being an evidence-based medicine um, advocate. I think what you tend to hear about acupuncture is there's no research to support it. And I think that's more about the research about how it's working, not necessarily if it is working because there are good quality clinical trials out there now that have been accepted into systematic reviews and into the evidence-based uh, literature, into clinical practice guidelines. So those clinical trials, trials are of high quality in certain areas. Uh, there were two trials this year that were published in JAMA, so those um, standards are extremely high to get published in that journal. So um, there are challenges with doing acupuncture trials, sham versus, you know, the control is, is always a challenge. Um, but if you can meet those standards, you, you, can, you can see the effects, whether they're, they're positive or not. Um, but acupuncture can be very helpful for certain issues in particular. And it, it may be helpful for more as the, as the evidence-based uh, literature grows, we may see that. Mm. Great. Is that a, does that help? Yeah, that's, that's a good okay. question. Right. Good answer. Could I just add one more thing? I mean, yeah, yeah, sometimes ahead. you always want to, everybody always asks, do you have the cure? And I, mm -hmm. I think that's the wrong way to go after it. Can you make things better, right? You know, I mean, yeah. can you slow things down to where it actually isn't going to be a problem? So even a 5% change or benefit is, you know, huge, you know, sometimes. Oh, so I think, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so I so. wholeheartedly agree. And so, so Jim's work and the work that they're doing, if if you could give a treatment um, on the sidelines or in the emergency room for somebody who's had a, a clear um, injury that warrants it, and you can get a 15, 20% um, effect, that can make the difference between getting back on the field in a, a couple of months, which I'm sure there are plenty of professional organizations that would, would find that interesting, uh, but also getting back to work or taking care of your family, getting back to school. So that, this, that can be huge. Right, using a combinational approach of different therapies, target uh, drugs like that one or acupuncture. Absolutely. Do, do you see that as maybe hopefully the the way we treat these patients? Yes, like I, exactly. I think approach. using a, using combinations of, of uh, uh, treatment approaches, having minimal side effects, um, optimizing a, a plan for the individual depending on what those issues are that they're experiencing, those, those uh, symptoms that are predominant for them, um, helping to modify their environment. Um, yeah, I think a combination approach will, will be, uh, would be great. And I think there's, all, there's room for innovation on that. We just don't see that. I mean, if you have a concussion on the field, if, if I was in a motor vehicle collision, you know, I guess we're gonna finish here about five o'clock, one of the most dangerous things we do is, is drive home. But if I go to the emergency room, I'm probably not going to have a head scan if I'm walking and talking. They're probably not going to do much for me. Um, there are no real treatment concussion centers. Uh, the emergency rooms don't really have a pathway to have people follow. So there's a lot of room for innovation just on the healthcare systems uh, approach, mm -hmm. let alone the treatments. Yeah. Thinking about kind of those research gaps as well, I think something that really helps identify who is more susceptible because uh, there are people that are faster evolvers uh, in CTE and are just more susceptible to the, the hits. And 
there's some classification of people that are showing more cognitive dysfunction versus those that have more kind of mood and behavior yeah. um, dysfunction. Uh, there's some correlation with APOE4 alleles, with, uh, uh, which is more correlated with Alzheimer's risk, but uh, potentially with CTE risk as well. And so, but there needs, needs to be more study. If someone is more susceptible or more likely to be a fast evolver, knowing that uh, would definitely change the, uh, their activities and course and other things you could do with that individual. So I'd like to open the discussion and for questions from the public if they want to ask any questions to our panelists. There's the microphone. Uh, Dr. Lechleiter, I know you have a long tenure as a researcher and a shorter one as an entrepreneur. Can you tell us what's been like the biggest surprise, best and worst discovery about going into that new venture? Um, it's an entirely different world, you know? So, so um, in, in one sense, as a basic science researcher, we're always told to go after mechanism, 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 you know, and, and we always say this translational sort of, you know, output. And, and, and so I think the best advice I can say is don't try and do it yourself. Try and find a business person to actually do the business side, you know, um, and, and basically, um, you know, it, you know, Bill's always said it takes, you know, good science and good business to actually make something work. It's kind of rare that you've got it in both of you and you've kind of kind of specialized a little bit. So. Now, there are lots of really good people in business, and it's just a different world, and it's very precise, and it's, you know, um, it's quite fascinating, but it is a completely different world, and I'm not sure I would be any good at starting my own business. I'm just sort of the science advisor, I guess. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you for, uh, for a wonderful panel. My name is Alan. I'm a PhD student. Uh, for one of my classes, I developed a therapy for refugees. And uh, I was basically taking three postmodern therapies, brief therapies, relaxation, um, solution focused. Um, and what we did is I decided, I put them together and I visited some of these camps in Greece and uh, asked them what they needed. In particular, the problem was answering to the problem of uh, suicide rates. A lot of these refugee camps are, you know, we see them as refugee camps, but they're actually, from their perspective, it can be like a prison. And so um, what they had is uh, suicide rates as early as nine years old, self-mutilation, and this is from camps in Greece. But then you have millions of people in camps in, in Jordan, Turkey. So um, once we got there, they told us, okay, we love this therapy. It's very cool. It's virtual reality therapy. You can deliver it over a phone through an app. But these uh, administrators came over and they came back to us and they said, well, what we need is actually surveys, psychological surveys. Because we have millions of people in these camps and we don't have any information on them. So we talked to Doctors Without Borders and different people and they said, well, we need physical aspects. We need questionnaires that ask these questions, not just PTSD questions not just psychological profile. So at this point, we're just developing this idea, just came out of the class, but um, my question to you is, where would I go at this point, having developed the design of the therapy and also a survey, put it within an app, but where would I take it as far as clinical trials and as far as uh, non-pharmaceutical treatments? What is the approach at that at this point? Do you, you have any advice or anything? Are you looking just at me? To give a <laughs> just to give a little background, I was uh, formerly yeah. with the World Bank, mm -hmm. but we did development studies and we did implementation of programs in different countries to alleviate poverty, and a lot of them had to do with health. But now I'm a philosophy student, uh, visual arts and aesthetics, so we're taking the approach from virtual reality, how to deliver that mechanism and that treatment. But the yeah. this is just where we are. And, but thank you for entrepreneurial week and for so, well, I would say, I mean, there's a, kind of two paths there. There's one that's kind of more of a commercial path or one that's more of a philanthropic path. And on the, either side, you're going to need probably a little more of a laser focus, too. So there's so many different options to go on that that you can kind of keep snowballing in a way that ends up being too massive to actually move. Um, on the commercial path, if there's something there that you can actually could attract some funding around or some intellectual property, 
you know, you can work with the, the technology office and kind of crystallize that and advance it on the commercial side. If it's on the philanthropic side, I think there's a, there's a pretty good community around San Antonio, which again, multiple people here can be networked into. And if there's other people that share that passion, maybe that's enough way to kind of get that opportunity seeded. You can kind of actually get more of a prototype or, or focus it further. But that's, again, that's already two pretty different paths uh, that uh, depend on kind of what the state of the technology and what could be done. Thank you. More questions? So I know in, in the work of both of you, your research um, over the years, there have been many innovations outside of what you guys have done that you've brought into your work, right? For example, um, types of techniques or you know new tools that you can use in order to push your research forward. So can you both talk a little bit about some of the latest tools that you're using in your in your work and you know how innovation has pushed your work forward? You want me to? Um, yeah, go ahead. Well, so, so um, yeah, research is always about sort of pushing ahead, and sometimes, most of the time, your best laid plans never pan out. I mean, so, so you propose things, you think you've got a great understanding of how things work, um, you test it, um, but then you get a new measurement or something, and all of a sudden, you don't quite understand, you know? And, and actually, that's when the fun part is in, because you can repeat it, you know that you something about the way you were thinking of this how this product worked is different you know so so in my case we've done things like most of my career we we're doing things in cell culture like i mentioned you know and there we just projected this must have something to do with the whole animal and then when we went into the whole animal it turns out things started working quite a bit different basically the same but whole animals is a different beast and so the entire approach of working in vivo has been a very big you know uh, technological advance. I mean, it really is, I would consider technological, where, where you know, it's, it's actually, not, uh, I mean, old physiologists, I would say, you know, um, had worked in whole animals, then we kind of went all the way down the reductionist approach, and now we've started to put it all back together again. And then secondary to that, there are now really incredible genetic techniques that have allowed us to go in and sort of mechanistically sort of dissect, well, is it really the astrocyte that's important to us? And, it may not be the only cell type, but clearly that's an important cell type for us to get the protective effect. Um, we can light cells up now, we can literally make them fluoresce, and so we can tell which cell types we're affecting. And we can acutely image single cells in the live animal. So all these things give us a better understanding of what the underlying mechanism is. And so presumably then we sort of define an entire pathway, not just a single target. But this is the process we want to sort of find ways, and maybe there's a better way in which you can stimulate it. So all those things are sort of, um, all those best laid plans have really helped us sort of give insight to some really fun work here, but then there are still the surprises, which are, that's what makes science fun too. And, <laughs> and I think it's sort of being brave enough when you do find an unexpected finding, to say that that's real and that can be important, you know, um, so. Yeah. Well, I think for me, the, the fun part has been trying this stuff on myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, tell, yeah, I, tell, I tell my patients, I, I, I won't have you do anything I wouldn't do myself. And so I, I, what's amazing now is, is the, uh, the sphere of performance enhancement that you see going on um, for, for normal able-bodied individuals, right? Everybody wants to think faster and remember more and sleep better. Everyone's hacking these biohacking tools and they're mm -hmm. perfect. For, for what I'm trying to do in the clinic because yeah, I can, I can help modify headaches and some, some of those severe issues, um, alleviate that, but to try and just increase overall health is gonna make a difference. So um, there's a lot of really cool stuff being developed. Um, and so I, I play with those things. I mean, there's uh, like these float tanks that you'll see around, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of getting back to a meditation response. I alluded to uh, electronic medicine, so there, there are some devices out there now. We use a, a plug for the company that I have nothing to do with is uh, Alpha Stim, and it's it's uh, it's fascinating. It's helping, um, and so we get 
we get manufacturers coming to us and if it seems reasonably safe and for the mild head injury population, you know, I'm not too concerned uh, about trying certain things. As long as it's FDA approved, you know, it, I'll try it and use it inappropriately and see what kind of side effects I get and then I'll, you know, <laughs> we'll try it. So um, that, that's been really different than what I thought I was going to be as a physician scientist, but it's, it's, it's actually a lot of fun. No. <laughs> no, I. The, yeah, exactly. My, I, I don't. I don't think most physicians do that, but they might be because of the fields they're in. I don't think an orthopedic surgeon is going to really. <laughs> right, right. So I, I have maybe I have the luxury of you know performance enhancement field, um, you know being interested in in sports medicine and sports performance. It kind of you know how can you how can you perform better? How can you live on five hours of sleep or four hours of sleep and be a, you know, a better performer. Um, who doesn't want that? So my, I know my patients do. I should be using the mic. We're talking about innovations. Can we talk a little bit about how these innovations can intersect with our DOD and VA counterparts um, here in San Antonio or nationally? And I know each one of you have experience doing that. So what those collaborations are like and, and how you what your personal experiences are with them. Is that is that directed towards me? The, the VA DOD? Sure. Yeah. Um, that working with the federal government, I, I think the best way to do it is, is as a clinical endeavor, as an academic approach, to get that academic foothold to, to see what the testing shows that may be, you know, to get funding to kind of support that. that that's a very uh, clear-cut path within those federal agencies. You know, that, that's an understood way to do things as opposed to trying to get a contract with the VA. Could be could be challenging. There, that's another animal. I, I don't know if that does that sound. You know. I mean, for the DOD, <coughs> if that's what we're talking, how did we actually start interacting with them? Yeah. I think there it, it's very different than say the NIH. NIH wants you to understand how things are working. The DOD really wants to know what can you do to protect our soldiers. You yeah. know, um, and and I think that's quite valid. So so it's not that they won't let you work on animals and preclinical, but you have to really. Um, find a way you have to, to really demonstrate, convince them, um, rationalize that actually this is actually a good system It's going to give good information that's going to lead to as rapidly as possible some sort of treatment. So, so I think it's really uh, very different, uh, um, two different mechanisms, I think. You, know, you really have to have the, the patient sort of, you know, the, the warrior sort of out there in front. So. Uh, that was the last question. Uh, but, but Teresa makes a really good point, uh, especially since entrepreneurship week here in San Antonio. We are lucky to have the, the Institute of uh, Surgical Research, the Army, and great research happening. And us as an institution, and he's the perfect example, Dr. Glider, Dr. Ramillo, working together and capitalizing on San Antonio's uh, diamond, which is the military. And that, that's a perfect example of how researchers can use the research and apply it directly translated into patients, specifically our soldiers. Uh, that, that was our last question. We're, I think, uh, we're gonna introduce our uh, councilman, correct? Yeah. yeah, go ahead, Robert. Well, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I hope you guys all found this as fascinating as I did. Um, but before we all rush off to the next event, I know we're all um, very fascinated in the next art and sciences event but um, we have a very special member of the community joining us. Joining us tonight is District 8 City Councilman Manny Palais, and um, he would like to say a few words for us. Thank you. Um, I am uh, a lawyer because I could not get into med school and become a um, medicine scientist, and it's a pleasure to be up here with such big frontal lobes. Um, I have, um, I, first of all, greetings from our mayor and our city council. We're really proud of you and very thankful that you're doing this in San Antonio. And we think you picked the right place to continue doing all your research and all of your work. Uh, Dr. Jaramillo, 
every movie produced by Marvel and DC starts off with a scientist who's experimenting on himself with the new meds. <laughs> and so um, I'm really looking forward to what uh, feats of strength you pull off uh, over I, the I next couple of months. Um, and, uh, and Dr. Lecklider, you know, um, as you describe hitting mice over the head five times a day for five days in a row, that's exactly what happens at city council uh, to <laughs> city council members. And so um, I, can, I can relate. <clears throat> I, uh, I, in all seriousness, San Antonio has a very long tradition of uh, finding walls and then finding and innovating ways to climb over them. And um, in 1963, uh, JFK gave his very last speech uh, prior, and, and the next day he was assassinated uh, in Dallas, but he gave his very last speech in San Antonio at Brooks City Base. And at Brooks, Air, I'm sorry, Brooks Air Force Base. And he was uh, inaugurating the opening of the new uh, Space and Flight uh, Medicine Science Research Center. And San Antonio after that became the innovator in space medicine and in flight medicine. But during that speech, he uh, recounted a story that he'd read by an Irish author. And in that story, um, there's a chapter about some boys that were walking down the street and docking, you know, walking down the way until they finally came to a tall wall and on the other side was an orchard. And they all said, well, there's no way for us to get over there. And one boy took off his cap and threw it over the wall. And they said, well, now we gotta go chase him. And uh, so what JFK said was, you know, this is our moment, 1963, to throw our cap over the wall of space and we've got to go chase it, right? Well, we've done that over and over and over again. You know, military flight, we innovated it and we started here in San Antonio. Space medicine, again, started here in San Antonio. We've made very important steps in innovating around burn science and trauma, uh, um, and the military's presence here has allowed us to save lives over and over and over again. And we are now the best practices and the best, you know, the benchmark for that kind of science. Southwest Research Institute is uh, innovating and has innovated for the past 30, 40 years um, more uh, successes than I could possibly list, but one of the important ones is, you know, uh, space shuttles and the Mars rover and all that. There's technology on there that came from San Antonio to make it possible for us to continue exploring. Um, the stent uh, that, you know, is now in millions of chests all over uh, the world came from San Antonio. In fact, it came from UT Health Science Center and Dr. Palmaz. And now I'm learning that Astrocyte is innovating a way out of this horrible curse that is TBI. And the very awful quality of life consequences that come with trauma and Alzheimer's and other um, you know, brain diseases. And so the idea that somehow, and this is a layperson's way of putting it, that you guys are developing a concussion pill is blows my mind. And I'm so happy to be on the same stage knowing that one day one or more of these guys was going to get a Nobel Prize. And um, so with that, there's a lot of folks in San Antonio who wish they would have understood a little bit, little bit better the stent technology and invested you know, when they finally spun out from UT Health Science Center and created their own company. And so please take my money. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and I'm, what I'm highlighting is, is that UT Health Science Center has a very long tradition of innovating. This is a living laboratory here, and not just innovating science, but innovating ways to create new jobs and create investment. And that economic development uh, ripple effect has very real consequences that we can see all over this medical center in jobs, and people are able to in, you know, have excellent qualities of life, create new businesses, employ more people, send their kids to college, live, work, play, thrive in San Antonio because brainiacs like these are inventing ways to recharge astrocyte cells and uh, really bringing science to business and business to science. And so with that, I thank you on behalf of all San Antonians who are going to be employed by your company when you hit it big. Uh, but more importantly, I thank you on behalf of my kids. 
and on behalf of all San Antonians out there who are suffering from some of these horrible conditions, and um, you really are doing very important work. And so with that, um, thanks to all of you for participating in San Antonio Entrepreneurship Week, and um, keep engaging. There's a lot more in store in San Antonio. You know, it's we're celebrating 300 years, um, and this is 300 years of commerce, 300 years of innovation, 300 years of science, 300 years of live, work, play, thrive, and the next 300 years is going to be great because of guys like you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>